Aloha for those of you joining us for this early detection training as part of the Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to take just a couple of moments for people to join and to get the Facebook live streaming. While you're joining us, please, um, there is a poll that you can see that has some, just a couple of quick questions asking for some of the background that really helps us with our planning every year for these for these Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Months. Yeah, mahalo Beth, aloha everybody. Mahalo for joining us this morning. Um, like Beth said, we're recording this session as well as going live on Facebook. So aloha to those joining us on Zoom as well as on Facebook. Um, just some housekeeping. So we are in a webinar format, which means we won't be able to see you or hear you, um, but please utilize the chat functions and the question and answer function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please put them in those, um, those buttons um, and we'll answer them at the end of the uh, presentation and um, bring them to Adam's attention as well. If you're joining us on Facebook, please comment any questions or comments into that um, comment section on Facebook and we'll address them live. Um, if you are watching this after it's been live, you can also still put in questions and we'll get back to you on our Maui Invasive Species Committee Facebook page. Um, the recording for this session will be found on the Hawaii Invasive Species Council YouTube, as well as the DLNR HISAM um, schedule, which I will put in the chat right now. And so you can see past recordings as well as um, what's coming up uh, this week and for the rest of the month. And so um, really quick, my name is Serena Fukushima. I'm the Public Relations and Education Specialist for the Maui Invasive Species Committee. I'm here with Beth Spieth with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council and Adam Radford, who I will introduce in just a second. Um, but if you are just joining us now and you see the poll, please participate in the poll. We've got about maybe 15 more seconds or so. Uh, really helpful for us to uh, know who's joining us and um, better format for the future. So a couple more seconds. If you haven't done the poll, please fill that out. All right. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and I'll share it briefly with everybody so you can see where everybody is coming from and what background. So we've got some representation from across the state with um, some different backgrounds and, and thank you so much for sharing that information. Mahalo. All right, thanks for joining us for our MISC Early Detection Training for Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. I'm here with Adam Radford. Adam is the manager of the Maui Invasive Species Committee, where he oversees efforts to control invasive plants, animals, and plant diseases that threaten Maui County's natural environment and quality of life. He earned his undergraduate degree at UH Manoa and holds a master's degree in natural resources management. He's trained scores of conservation workers in safe repelling techniques and developed successful approaches to some of Maui's most challenging invasive species problems. He's recognized as a conservation leader, both locally and statewide, and was tapped to develop an invasive species inventory for the Republic of Palau's protected area network. So mahalo Adam, welcome. And without further ado, I will pass it on to him. Yeah, thank you, Serena and uh, Beth for getting this all together and the introduction. And so, yeah, so this is an early detection training, but when I put this presentation together, I realized there's so much to this. And one of my main points that I wanna make is that the training is unique to each island. Um, and it looks like we have some big island representation and other islands. So anyway, I'm Maui focused in this presentation, but the point is just that I'm going to show some examples of like things we do on Maui that might be helpful for other islands and neighbor islands. And also, so obviously I'm with Maui Invasive Species Committee, but we work very closely with the Molokai Maui Invasive Species Committee as well. And so when it comes to invasive species, it's like there's always new immigrants, right? Like there's always new things showing up, like it could be coneheads um, from wherever. 
<laughs> or you know new new things so it's like i always go with the um when it comes to early detection i go with the the tsa philosophy of if you see something say something like if you see something new or unique or hear something new or unique please let us know and i'll get into how you let us know here in a little bit but it, the second part of the equation to me is then when it comes to early detection, it's like, oh, we found something new. Did we get them all or do, how do we respond? And I'm gonna speak to that here as I go through my presentation. But um, so it's it's really when it comes to early detection, I, I think it's the two main things. It's, it's sort of pre-border, which is department ag um, and border, again, department ag. And then it, what I'm talking about is more stuff that slips through the cracks. And so it gets in and established within our island ecosystems. So what's the problem with new arrivals? Well, I think most on this call would know the answer to that question, but um, it's very clear that we have a high rate of introduction and in, uh, for the Maui Invasive Species Committee anyway, typically about every two years we choose to take on a new target and i'll talk about how we make that decision also but um so about every two years we have something that shows up that's problematic that meets all the criteria that we discuss and we take action against it so i did want to raise though the amnesty versus action component of so department ag has an amnesty program and that is an option for people so like if you accidentally brought you know um tropical fish say to hawaii and you didn't realize that that's a problem you can um turn that over to department ag with with no consequence if you don't turn it over and you choose to try to release those fish say or a snake is an even more clear example you may face penalties for that um so anyway this is just an outline of what i'm going to run through here and obviously the main focus is on early detection and rapid response so these are pretty basic concepts in terms of problems with new arrivals is that they compete with native species for food use native species as food uh, destroy the landscape spread non-native species and diseases and pose a threat to human health and quality of life and of course control can be costly but it also can be costly say for a cokey frog where you have real estate values declining due due to their presence So just getting into this a little bit more in terms of what I was talking about, about amnesty and then also um, potential penalties. So this is talking mostly about um, animals such as snakes or large reptiles. Um, you all can read the slide, but um, there's also rules about plants which is important to know in terms of state uh, noxious weeds and the des designation as a noxious weed and potential ramifications for importing those, which is admittedly quite easy in the plant, especially seed industry. Like, so you can order seeds from, you know, California or wherever, and it, it is difficult for the Department of Ag to screen all of those orders that go through the mail but it is important to know that there is, there are um, mechanisms in place to allow the department ag and also the maui invasive species committee or other invasive species committees to do their work so i i guess i would just be clear that like the maui invasive species committees none of the invasive species committees have the legal authority to utilize these rules it all really boils down to department ag or department of land and natural resources um, but they're there and they have been used in the past to help mostly with access to properties and or um, encourage 
you know, someone with a snake or a, an animal that lacks, acts like a snake, like a veiled chameleon, um, to take action. So for our program, the, the, the picture on the bottom here is something we produced and we're in process to reproduce is an early detection guide for not just our staff, but for people working in the in in agriculture and um, landscaping and whatever is relevant and make it widely available to the public. And so again, training in terms of what we're looking for is really important because a lot of people don't know what say, you know, plants we're interested in or things we're concerned about what they even look like. And so having these guides is really critical, I think, to informing the public and our partners about the things we're concerned about. And then again, the same message I already relayed of just reporting what you see. And these are ways you can report um, through the 643 PEST hotline. And then also for Maui, which might be an idea for others listening to this call is that for really critical things like snakes, um, we actually have it established with our local police department. We have a, a phone tree uh, um, in action plan basically developed with them to respond. And so that might be something that could be entertained on other islands if it's not already in existence. So just a thought there. Um, so when we receive new reports of things, which again, like our citizen science scientists are our greatest asset, really, like they're the ones out there seeing and hearing new things. And so we do interviews to see like, are they really hearing a cookie frog? Are they really seeing a snake? Um, and so there's a process with that that's relatively straightforward it's it's either informal meaning just a follow-up call or it's more for, formal like we follow the usgs recommendations for um determining the presence and or absence of snakes and then what that snake might be and then it leads to a decision um to take action or not and then, of course, there's a subsequent component that's outreach and follow up, regardless of the decision, right? So, if it's deemed, say, to be a snake, that outreach effort is going to be much more significant. And we would utilize all of our possibilities, meaning social media, uh, press release, things like that, to garner more information. So, if it's not a snake, the follow-up might be as simple as just getting back to the reporter and saying, we don't think it was a snake or we found the snake, but it actually turned out to be a rubber snake. And then for things like this, snakes is the example I'm using here, but having interview components together and ready to utilize are, are really key because you, you want to be able to get to a definitive conclusion. Um, if you aren't sure, that again can end up taking a lot of time and money away from your project to figure out what's going on. So decision making for us, I want to highlight that we have about 30 different species <clears throat> that we're looking for but they're very hard to find and that's mainly because people have never seen them um so again that's where the training component is so key and then for us decision making we go through our committee that's why we're called the maui invasive species committee which is a group of scientists and topic area experts and and the public that weighs in on like, is this really gonna be a problem? And so when we are trying to answer that question, we look at a few key elements that are extent of infestation, um, threat to native species and, and the environment in general and or 
our quality of life as people. And then we also, because sometimes that science doesn't exist or it's not published, we look at examples from similar ecosystems and say, okay, does it look like this is gonna be a big, little or small problem and make a, a decision from there. But as I already mentioned, on average, we take on a new target about every two years. And I just wanted to mention in terms of early detection, the Mamalu Poi Poi program, which is a program focused on ports of entry that we participate in and the other invasive species committees participate in. And that's looking for things like coconut rhinoceros beetle, which has not been found on Maui, uh, little fire ant and others. So anyway, it's a great avenue for um, early detection. So I'm just gonna move this. Um, <clears throat> this is a map showing what we call eradicable plant species on Maui. So again, these are things that got past the border that did establish that we subsequently removed. And it just shows where those things were generally and what they were. And, but what I wanted to focus on on this slide actually is just about the how to collect new samples of things you might see. Um, and so that's on, for me anyway, to the right of this slide is how to submit plant samples, how to submit animal samples. Um, but the, when it, I guess like to me, the, <laughs> the gist of it is if you see or find a random plant or animal, pull the plant out or kill the animal and submit it based on the recommendations here. But like, again, having a broader group than just ISC staff and others out trying to control these things, like meaning everyone in the public looking and removing things that are new or uncertain or problematic is very helpful. Um, oh, and then let's see. Yeah, so these are just a few of our top priority species. And this is actually straight out of uh, the older version of our early detection guide. So Myconia calvescens, um, the watershed destroyer plants, it shades out other plants and um, creates quite a bit of runoff problems and landslides and things like that. And uh, so Koki frog is, it's um, also an ecosystem changer. It changes the soil content um, where they're present. And, uh, you know, at 22,000 frogs an acre, it, at least that is gonna have an impact on the, the environment. Um, so I won't get it too far into the details on all of these, but little fire ant also um, one of the worst invasive species in the world. So we're we're on the lookout for these things all the time, aside from a, a vast array of other species that we're we're looking for. But again, it's just a heads up and a if you see something, say something. If you hear something, say something, please. Um, so just getting more into detail on a couple of things in, is conures and parrot-like birds. So we have at least two species that have naturalized on Maui. And in the last year, we've had two more show up, the red vented bulbul and uh, rose ring parakeet. So these things keep coming in. And what we've learned is that, unfortunately, one of the most effective ways to remove these birds is to shoot them, um, but that can be really difficult in say a residential setting or other settings. I mean, unless they're very clearly a released pet, it's really hard. Um, and so this is just an example of one project we've worked on with the mitered conures and, and where we're at with it. But um, yeah, new, new birds in particular seem to be showing up more frequently, at least on Maui. And 
this guy, the veiled chameleon is another one I would really like to ask the group to look out for, even though we haven't found one since 2008. Um, these are efforts we've made to remove this chameleon from Maui. And it, it, this chameleon basically can act like a snake in our environment. So meaning eat small birds and things like that. So, and I think the largest one we caught was about 22 inches long from tip to tail. So it can be actually a, a quite large chameleon. So this is another good example of rabbits because we have a, a influx of rabbit releases at the moment. And so what's the big deal? So this describes that and um, in what the law actually says about keeping rabbits and also what response may be if, if they're not kept appropriately, which appropriately means off the ground so that they don't spread to Lermaria. Um, so the, this slide just describes that and I'll just leave it on for a second so people can read it. So snakes on Maui, um, we have had a, a few snakes certainly show up and un, I guess fortunately most of them are deceased already, but um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Uh, so when talking with Hawaii Department of Agriculture about this, so records from 1990 to 2000 indicated hundreds of snake sightings, credible sightings, like I talked about interview process already. Um, and these were mostly of free roaming animals that were not recovered. And these snakes arrived primarily through smuggling of pet am animals, but some snakes were ac accidentally introduced as cargo stowaways. So for a 10 year period uh, it, that I'm describing, um, 236 credible sightings of snakes were reported in Hawaii. So it's significant. And of the 236 reports, only 22 snakes were found dead, 41 captured or roaming free, and 74 were captive animals. Surrendered voluntarily under the Department of Ag's amnesty program, which I described briefly earlier, or confiscated by Department Ag personnel, which that gets into the legal aspects of what I was describing in a previous slide. So, I mean, regardless, this leaves 99 presumed snakes roaming free, but un uncaptured or unclaimed. So this, this remains one of our top priorities. And I just wanted to highlight one of the techniques we've been able to utilize for snakes in both in Hawaii and in Guam where brown, snakes, brown tree snakes are prevalent is the use of airsoft electric guns. Um, so this is a hobby grade toy air gun. So it's not regulated, it's not a firearm. So when you define a firearm, it needs to have fire to fall into that category. Um, so you can actually check these guns, if you will, in to your carry-on baggage or check-in baggage when you're flying somewhere. So that, that's what made this very appealing in Guam for rapid response throughout CNMI and other places in the Pacific. Um, so it's, it's just an option and it, it's been proven to be very effective. So prevention is the best strategy. And I just wanted to highlight in terms of plants, I, I didn't hit this in the slide, I wanted to, but um, I think having 
really knowledgeable and trained early detection and rapid responders on staff are available to you as a partner or however you can do it is critical. So we're fortunate enough to have Forrest and Kim Starr on the MISC staff um, who do our early detection and rapid response. So they're looking for things like NIOTHRIPS and basically everything. And so it was interesting because I asked them about just a history of, of what they've found. And so what they said was that from 2000 to 2020, they published 403 new plant records statewide. And so that's about 20 new plant records a year or one record every two and a half weeks. That's pretty amazing. And they also manage the you know uh, insect ID website and plant ID website and other things. So, I mean, having these people available to your program is huge. So these are just, I guess my, how I break down uh, thinking about early detection and rapid response. So obviously prevention is the best strategy. Finding it early is the next step if you can. Um, sticking to the game plan, that means that decision-making process with your whoever your overseers are and then see it through, whether that decision is even just let's find out more. And um, measuring searcher efficacy is, is really important. Like with the Veiled Chameleon Project, for example, we, we had searchers record um, Jackson's chameleons just to see were they seeing a chameleon which Jacksons are widespread in the same area. Um, and it, it actually was very helpful because some searchers were not very good at finding Jackson's chameleons and others were really good at it. So then you, if you need to make a decision also of like, well, who's looking for something that that's helpful. Um, and also that helped just that example with the Jacksons helped with searcher fatigue. So, when you're looking for something and not finding it, that people can get worn out on the, the task at hand, but it's the same for plants. Like if you have somebody knowledgeable about the plants they're seeing, you can use those as teachable moments to say like, this is what you're seeing, even though you're not seeing what we're actually looking for. So, and for us, we're, super data driven and systematic and the data drives how we're systematic, like where we're going, how big of an area are we searching, all those relatively straightforward questions. But And then keeping the public involved, of course, is huge and leveraging resources. So for our projects, we rely heavily on partners to help us with what we're doing, not only just looking for target species, but actually coming out and doing the work. Um, so that that's a we're really fortunate that we have that ability to work closely with partners. And also, I guess I would say um, the opportunity to learn from them and help them with their projects and go out to places we may not be working and see what they're doing and learn about new things. So it's a great professional development opportunity. Um, this is pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, so the end is take a break because a lot of these early detection rapid response initiatives are tiring. It takes a lot of time and effort. And so just recognizing that that's what you're getting into and you know, get back to your partners, summarize your findings, but then just take a break because there's, like I said, about every two years, we have something very significant significant that comes up on Maui that we need to deal with. And it, it, it can be quite um, overwhelming to make those decisions and take on the task, but I'm not trying to discourage anyone from doing so, but just recognizing that it, it's challenging. And so 
just more resources and just sort of a what you can do again from a, a previous iteration of our field guide about actions that can be taken to not spread invasive species and who to contact. So just some resources for everyone. And just a mahalo to, these are all partners we work very closely with and funders. Um, we're just really fortunate that we have this network of support in Hawaii. And I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at is that tap into that network if you haven't already. There, there's a huge network of, of people and we're really lucky in Hawaii because I, I believe in some places it, conservation projects can actually be kind of competitive, if you will, if certainly not, they're not cooperative. Um, and in Hawaii, I feel like we're all, we have a shared vision, a big vision, and we're all working together and cooperating to see that vision realized. So if you're not already, I would tap into that network of people. So I think that's all I got. Mahalo Nui, Adam, that was really great. Um, I There's a fact that you've shared in the past that I think is always really startling that, you know, when um, the original colonizer species were arriving to Hawaii that eventually evolved into our native plants and animals we see today, those original species arrived to Hawaii on their own and maybe one new species established in Hawaii every two to 5,000 years. And in modern days, um, what, what's that number now of species arrival rate? It's like one every three days, I think, right? A new plant or animal is detected. Yeah, Something like it, that was yeah. Just staggering. Um, yeah, poor plant pathogen. Yeah, and Meaning, so mean... like, for example, like rapid ohia death would be an example of a plant. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that every single one of those species that comes releases in the environment or becomes invasive, but just the fact that every three days something new arrives, I think really just drives in the point of what you're talking about and what this training is about is that invasive species really is a cockle thing. It They affect all of us. And it's really all of our kuleana, our responsibility to keep an eye out. So I like your TSA message. If you see something, say something. And um, I dropped in the chat our statewide pest hotline, 643pest.org, which Beth helps to manage, as well as the phone 643pest um, to call. And I really like to just encourage people, if it looks different, even if you're kind of like, eh, I don't really know, just report it, put it out there, because you never know if you're finding something that is a new island record that's never been found before. So, well, well, not only that, Serena, those are all really good points. But I would say that, like, even if you just want to know what it is, like, if mm -hmm. it's even if it's not necessarily new, but you're just curious, like, what is this thing I'm seeing? What is this plan? Um, we can help answer those questions. Absolutely. Yep. All right. We do have some questions in the chat. So first one, and also really quick, we're still live on Facebook. So if anyone's joining us on Facebook, there's a couple people there. If you have any questions, please drop it in the comment box there. But here in Zoom, I see Bill Pereira. He's asking if the list of 30 species that we're looking for is available to the public. Uh, that would be it. I, I'm actually not sure if the current list Serena is on the website, but it could certainly be made available. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I it's available. The, website, so the short, I'll look into the short that. answer is yes, but where I, I honestly, I, I don't know that offhand. We may have had that in a slide and presentations, but that's a really good question, Bill. And we'll put that, we'll work on that and get that up on the MISC website to yeah. take a look at. Um, all right, we have a question with uh, Sam Bergstrom. Is there anything being done about the cookie frogs on the Big Island or are there just too many? There's too many. And we do have some folks with this um, that will be presenting this month. Um, I don't think necessarily on Koki, but um, they have some really good information about Koki on Hawaii Island as well, Sam. 
Yeah, so I would just clarify a little bit. So there's definitely too many for the Big Island to deal with, like across a on a landscape scale. But there are still community groups that are sort of defending their borders, if you will, which is a different approach than on the other islands where we're we're working towards eradication. Um, but so there is there are efforts being made on Big Island, but it, it's just a different. Um, way to look at the problem. All right, uh, we have another question. Um, they're saying, great presentation, Adam. I know brown tree snakes have decimated the native bird life on Guam. How do you practice brown tree snake response with no snakes to practice on in Hawaii? And I like, I, anyway. Yeah, it's a yeah, that's answer. a great question. So. <laughs> So we do we do a couple of different things. So one is that uh, we have staff that go go to Guam regularly to get trained and or sort of refreshed on identification and snake handling. So we actually go and manage live snakes there in in Guam. But what we do on a broader scale or have done prior to COVID, because unfortunately that's limited some of our in-person trainings and interactions is we do, we there's some really good fake snakes out there that will hide all over the forest and have staff try to find them. So those are ways we, we try to train staff, but we also have um, for the Maui Invasive Species Committee anyway, we have four trained uh, rapid responders that are part of the USGS rapid response network that's based, the training is all based out of Guam. And actually on staff, we have the previous trainer for brown, street, brown, brown tree snake response on Guam. He's working for MISC on Maui now. So we, we're, we're actually pretty well set up to do that. And I know other programs do as well. So like when we have a Brown tree snake response. We include Department Ag and DLNR because it kind of depends on where the snake is, who's going to respond. But all of those staff involved in the response are trained to administer a, a questionnaire and make a determination of what we're dealing with and then how we respond. So it's it's a cooperative effort. And I believe the person you're talking to um, is in the audience right now, Adam Fox, right? Is he our person on staff? So he's actually giving a presentation on February 8th um, that goes a little more in depth in new detections and rapid response that MISC was doing throughout 2021 and 22 with some more um, details on uh, brown tree snake and other species too. So just a quick plug for that one. Um, and we do presentations as well um, and workshops with Keiki, with students, community groups as well. If you want to kind of practice your snake finding skills, we can set that up also. Um, okay, we have another question with Mon from Monty. Um, is there a formal statewide BOLO list, so be on the lookout list, of species not known to be in Hawaii, but which we should all be on the lookout for? If not, whose kuleana should it be to create one? And in parentheses, it seems like there must be a huge number of species already wreaking havoc in other island ecosystems around the Pacific that don't get the same airtime as, say, brown tree snakes and red imported fire ant. So do we already have a formal statewide BOLO list? There actually is a, a list, um, and there's, but it's an ever, it's a constantly moving target, right? So, I mean, there's things to look out for, but that's why I make my statement really general about like, if you see something, say something, because even though there might be a list that it, it you never know what's gonna show up, right? So um, we can share that as well, but um, I, I guess my point is, I don't know how relevant a list is except for learning those species, but, um, and that's gonna vary by island pretty drastically, so. Um, Can I do a little I guess plug? I try to keep it simple. And yeah, Beth, you could probably weigh in on this 
<laughs> as well. I was just going to say that there is going to be, it is not a formal list by any means, because that is a moving target, as, as Adam was mentioning. Um, it's constantly changing. It's different for every island. But tonight at six, um, the Oahu Invasive Species Committee is going to give a presentation on a small number of current BOLO targets. Um, and so please join join them for that tonight at six. Yep, and like Adam mentioned as well, we are revamping our early detection um, guide, which is a little more Maui specific, but we're doing it in a format where it'll be easy to sort of interchange um, the cards essentially in the pages of what these species are so that we can have updates and then also have it on our website. So that's a little more Maui specific, but um, that will include all those species um, and we do have a training that's going to be hopefully implemented at this some point this year um, that that also focuses on that too um, but yeah and then I, I guess well. in response to Monty's question too just one thing is that um, I mean I mentioned some of the top priorities that Monty you you know those if you're still on um, but also if you're looking for like a list of plants I shared that slide with a list of plants that and and I can send it to anyone that's interested, but that 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 is our, for MISC anyway, that's basically our look, our top look for plants because they're, we, we believe them to be eradicated and or very much contained. Yeah, and we got Dr. Fern Duval. There's a 10 most unwanted species from sea gaps. Um, some of those are dated now though. Um, so I don't know, Fern, if you're able to find the link where that is, we could drop that in the chat or we can, one of us can look for that as well. But um, there's a lot of things out there, but yeah, a statewide list is a good idea and good question, Monty, as well. Um, we have another, uh, we have another question from Bill. Have any poisonous snakes been sighted or found? And I'm assuming that's maybe on Maui or just in Hawaii in general. Fern might be able to answer that question better than me, but uh, we've found sea snakes that are technically poisonous, but the odds of being envenomated are incredibly low. Um, and those so, are technically indigenous too, right? Are sea snakes? That's right. Yeah. So no, no black mambas or anything like that to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, but that's where again, Fern, well, in Hawaii, was the question in Hawaii or on Maui? Um, it's not specific. So Bill, if you have a specific place. Um, because in, in Hawaii there, I mean, brown tree snake has been reported and I believe captured. So technically that's a venomous snake. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't want those here at all. So definitely- We do not want them here, here, no. Report, call, call the police. Fern says yes. Or just run it over. Sorry to be so blunt. <laughs> but if in you Hawaii, see a snake and you yeah. can kill it, kill the snake. Yes. Safety. And then make a phone call. Fern says that cobras in Lahaina were not located, but the shed skin was found. That makes me very scared. <laughs> Well, I mean, the, uh, this is the stuff, though, and it's really, it's great that people report things, but we had a, I think it was an alligator or a crocodile reported in East Maui at one point, which I think was not a valid report, but just saying, like, random stuff just shows up. Yeah, awesome. Um, I feel like I, I would like to elect Fern, Dr. Fern Duval for a presentation next year on some of the craziest EDRR early detection <laughs> stories and reports that he's received because if you ever have met Dr. Duval and sat down and chatted with him there's some wild stories about reports and potential sightings of all kinds of things on Maui and I like that analogy of sometimes if you can turn the island upside down and shake it we'd be really surprised to see some of the things that might be be lurking either intentionally or unintentionally um <laughs> Bill says Cobra that'd be thank great, god for mongooses that'd be a great presentation <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, if we have any other questions, we want to start wrapping this up shortly. Um, but if anyone has any final questions or comments for Adam, please put that in our question and answer box or our chat, um, as well as on Facebook. 
Uh, Fern is saying, good point, Fern. Any snake must be considered poisonous unless it's ID'd. So that's a really good strategy. If you think you see a snake, consider it and assume that it's poisonous until it gets captured and ID'd. And just run that bugger over if you see them. That's the best strategy. <laughs> Well, thank you both for the opportunity to present today. And um, yeah, and anyone yeah. listening in, please reach out to us if you have further questions or would like more information. Yeah, mahalo, Adam. And if you want to drop in the chat where people can reach you, um, put your email in there. If anyone has any follow-up questions, you could also visit MauiInvasiveSpecies.org to get in touch with us. Um, for this week, um, our next presentation is tomorrow. Uh, actually, no, it's tonight. Um, and Beth mentioned this already and put it in the chat, but we have Oahu Invasive Species Committee um, presenting tonight at six o'clock on emergent pests in Hawaii, followed by a presentation uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning. And that's Invasive Species Control Work in the Nature Conservancy's Kanepu Preserve. So we're going to head over to the island of Lanai for that presentation by Kekoa Gurat, who I believe is in here right now too. So aloha Kekoa, looking forward to your presentation tomorrow. Friday, we also have a virtual huaka'i um, in our Vau Kanaka, which is the vau that we're in. It's our human dwelling realm um, in our island. So you can hele on to Kauai on Friday for that presentation as well. And I'm gonna throw in the chat again, just the link of all of our calendar presentations. Um, if you missed any presentations during the last week, then you can go to the site as well. Beth has been putting up the recording so you can watch them there or our Maui based presentations, uh, Maui Nui presentations are gonna be on our MISC Facebook as well. Uh, oh, one last little, chat about snakes. So Adam Knox, who is our boundary snake trainer, said there was a King Cobra report on Oahu six to seven years ago, which turned out to be a falsified report meant to scare people away from an area. It highlights the importance of the interview and investigation process that Adam highlighted. So yeah, really good point there, Adam. Thanks for bringing that up. But all right, I think we've just got some mahalos People thanking you for your presentation. With that, we will say ahuiho. Thanks, everybody. And if you see something, say something, report those tests. Mahalo. <laughs>